Hi, I'm Juan, a producer on the Lectures in History podcast team. And this week, University of Washington lecturer Ross Cohen discusses the development of the Oregon country, specifically how the United States and Britain divided the Northwest Coast. Stay tuned. Class begins right after this. Wyndham Hotels and Resorts makes travel possible for all. Whether it's the long haulers looking for a great cup of coffee, a roomier rest for the on a whim road trippers, or a place to make summer memories with the whole family. No matter who you are, where you're going, or why, with 24 trusted brands to choose from like La Quinta, Days Inn, and Super 8, your Wyndham is waiting. Get the lowest price at WyndhamHotels.com. Restrictions apply. Visit website for more details. All right, good afternoon, students. Welcome back to class. Today, we will be discussing the Oregon country, specifically the Oregon boundary and the process by which the United States and Great Britain negotiated the boundaries between the United States and Canada as we know them today. Starting in 1818, Great Britain and the United States agreed to a joint occupancy of the Oregon country. That uh, occupancy would last for the next three decades. By 1846, the two nations would sign a treaty that established the borders as we know them today. And so today in class, let's walk through those three decades of history, talk about the different interests that the two nations had in the regions, You'll see uh, the differences in approaches to colonization on the part of Great Britain and the United States, all building up to the resolution of the Oregon boundary. Okay? All right. Let's step back a little bit, and let's begin with the general process by which the United States established itself as a nation and asserted control over its borders. There are two broad factors at play here when we consider territorial acquisition by the United States. The first, the United States needed to dispossess the indigenous peoples of the continent and extinguish their claims to their land. Now, this manifests with federal Indian policy and the removal of native peoples to reservations uh, in, in the Pacific Northwest. That process starts in the 1850s. That's going to be a subject for a future lecture. The second broad factor, which we will discuss today, is that the United States, the United States needed to interact with other non-native powers, particularly the nations of Europe, in order to define American claims to territory. Now, most American territory came into the nation's possession by wars or purchases. The Revolutionary War, as you see here on this slide, produced most of the territory east of the Mississippi River. The Louisiana Purchase in 1803 brought most of the lands between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains into the nation. And then war with Mexico in 1846 uh, to 1848 incorporated the American Southwest. And then in 1867, the United States purchased Alaska from Russia. And so you see with each of those um, territorial acquisitions, they are functions of war and or purchase. The territory that, that becomes the Pacific Northwest, however, was appended to the nation in a somewhat unusual faction. Not war, not purchase. Rather, the Pacific Northwest, the Oregon country, went through a phase in which the two primary claimants to the region, that's the United States and Great Britain, agreed to share it for an indefinite time. This is the so-called joint occupation I referred to earlier. The Convention of 1818 was an agreement between Great Britain and the United States that resolved territorial disputes following the War of 1812. 
The Convention of 1818 first established the 49th parallel as the border from the Great Lakes to the Rocky Mountains. So this is the the northern border of the United States as we know it today. The border that separates, you know, present day North Dakota from Manitoba, uh, Montana from Saskatchewan and Alberta and so on. And so that Convention of 1818 then established that border at the 49th parallel from the Great Lakes in the east to the Rocky Mountains in the west. And then the Convention of 1818 authorized the joint occupancy of the Oregon country, whereby the rights of both British subjects and American citizens to occupy and to trade in the region would be respected. Now the second way then that the Pacific Northwest becomes American territory that differs from other acquisitions is that um, the matter was not resolved by war or by purchase, but rather by treaty. The two nations signed a treaty in 1846 in which Britain and the United States negotiated a final resolution to this dispute. This was complemented by similar agreements Uh, on the East Coast, uh, resolved in 1842 between Maine and Canada. And both sets of regulations then, um, or both sets of negotiations, excuse me, were uh, part of a process whereby the two nations reached uh, a substantial accommodation with one another, uh, particularly after the conflicts of the American Revolution and the War of 1812. All right, let's take a look at the Oregon country and define exactly what it is we're talking about here. The Oregon country is generally defined as the region from the Rocky Mountains in the east to the Pacific Ocean in the west. From the 42nd parallel in the south, this is the border between uh, today between Oregon and California, and then north to 54 degrees, 40 minutes of latitude. That's today's border between Alaska and British Columbia. Now, as you know from previous lectures, much of this territory was initially uh, claimed by Spain in the 1770s and the 1780s. Even after Spain's withdrawal from Nootka Sound on Vancouver Island in the 1790s, um, Spain still maintained a presence, rather limited, but still a presence on the Northwest Coast, um, in part by virtue of its holdings in California. We also have to remember Russia, which by 1790 had established its colony in Russian America, or Alaska, to the north. And remember, the Russians had also established a trading post, Fort Ross, on uh, the, the western coast, the California coast, north of San Francisco. So initially, at least, Spain and Russia are still nominally involved in the Oregon country. By about 1820, however, both Spain and Russia had withdrawn from the region, uh, mostly for logistical reasons. And so this leaves Britain and the United States as the two primary claimants to the region. All right. Remember, the British presence in the Oregon country took the form of the Hudson's Bay Company. Prior to the 1820s, the Hudson's Bay Company uh, operated exclusively east of the Rocky Mountains. This was in uh, all lands that uh, were part of the watershed draining into Hudson's Bay. And the HBC held a monopoly, a crown monopoly, on all economic activity in that region. In 1821, however, the Hudson's Bay Company merged with the Northwest Company and acquired its assets and holdings in the Oregon country. And here again, there we see George Simpson, who was the director, the governor of the uh, HBC's Columbia Department, which was headquartered in Fort Vancouver on the Columbia River. Excuse me. In 
Now, American interest in the Oregon country at this time took the form not of any institutional power of the national government, as was the case with Britain and its monopoly company, the Hudson's Bay Company, but rather American interest in the Oregon country in this era took the form of individuals, individual Americans who had migrated to the region. As we've discussed in previous classes, the so-called mountain men, such as uh, Jedediah Smith, these are fur trappers from the Rocky Mountains, um, began to filter into Oregon in the late 1820s. And then the 1830s, we see uh, missionaries, American missionaries, begin to enter the region. Henry and Eliza Spaulding, Marcus and Narcissa Whitman, and here you see Marcus Whitman uh, in, a, in an image. Um, Marcus Whitman arriving on the Great Divide, basically cresting the Rocky Mountains and beginning entrance into the Oregon country on the 4th of July, 1836. And these missionaries, of course, were arriving in the Oregon country in an attempt to um, convert indigenous peoples to Christianity, but also to proselytize to the increasing numbers of, of uh, settlers, American settlers, who were arriving in Oregon. That said, however, the American presence in Oregon was fairly limited, uh, initially at least. In 1840, there were only about 150 Americans residing in the entire Oregon country. Only 150 in that entire region. That number would increase dramatically, however. By 1845, just five years later, about 5,000 U.S. settlers had entered the Oregon country. Many having traveled overland on the famous Oregon Trail, and many of them clustered in the Willamette Valley in uh, present-day uh, state of Oregon, uh, drawn to the Willamette Valley primarily uh, for the region's fertile farmland. Remember also that in the 1830s, epidemic diseases such as smallpox, measles, influenza, also a malarial outbreak uh, in the Willamette and Columbia River Valleys in the 1830s had devastated indigenous communities. Um, in the, the Willamette Valley, uh, death rates uh, for some native uh, communities was as high as 90%. And so when missionaries and American fur trappers began entering the country, they found the Willamette Valley and other parts of the Oregon country depopulated. And they viewed this as open land, theirs for the taking, not to mention evidence of the providence of, of God that had directed them uh, to these open lands. And so, from the 1820s to the mid-1840s, we've got the Hudson's Bay Company, and then American settlers jointly occupying the Oregon country, exactly as had been spelled out in the Convention of 1818. Over time then, both groups sought to solidify their claims to the region. Now, neither Britain nor the United States expected to gain full control of Oregon. Let's look at this map again. East of the Continental Divide, that is east of the Rocky Mountains, the U.S. and Britain in the Convention of 1818 had agreed on that border running along the 49th parallel from the Great Lakes in the east to the Rocky Mountains in the west. Now, virtually from the start of discussion over Oregon, the British expected that border to continue west along the 49th parallel to the Columbia River and then from there to follow the river to the ocean. So here we see the 49th parallel extending from the east. The British expected that where the 49th parallel intersected with the Columbia River, 
the border would then follow the Columbia down into present-day Washington State and out to the mouth of the Columbia at the border between present-day Washington State and Oregon. So the British were willing, in other words, to concede to the United States all lands south and east of the Columbia River. But they wanted to maintain access to the river itself, which, of course, was the main transportation artery for the company. Remember, the Hudson's Bay Company had established a number of trading posts along not just the Columbia, but the Willamette and and the Snake uh, and other rivers in the territory. And so the British, hoping that the, the border would follow the Columbia River, would uh, enable them to keep access to the Columbia River and hold on to the trading forts that they had established along the river. They also wanted control over Puget Sound, which they rightly regarded as a superior harbor on the northwest coast. Now, Americans, for their part, did not expect to acquire any territory north of the 49th parallel. But they also coveted Puget Sound and access to the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Keep in mind that during the 1820s and the 1830s, the United States had no good harbor on the Pacific coast. San Diego and San Francisco were first uh, Spanish outposts and then, and then later part of uh, Mexico. The shoreline of Oregon offers few good harbors, and the, the, the mouth of the Columbia, where the Columbia empties into the Pacific Ocean, that region um, was notorious for interfering with uh, attempts to, to, uh, to travel uh, from the river to the ocean or, or from the ocean into the, the Columbia. Until the conclusion of war with Mexico in 1848, the U.S. regarded Puget Sound as the best protected deep water harbor on the Pacific coast. And so the boundary dispute then between these two nations essentially comes down um, to Puget Sound and the area of land, the region between the Columbia River and the 49th parallel. So if we look again at this map, Britain was prepared to concede to the United States everything to the south and east of the Columbia River. Britain hoped to maintain this region right here, present-day western Washington, everything north and west of the Columbia and south of the 49th parallel, including Puget Sound. Americans, for their part, desired the same area and and wanted the border between the two nations to run along the 49th parallel all the way to the ocean. What we're really talking about here then, as far as this this conflict, this controversy, is this area right here, present-day western Washington. All right, let me pause here for a sec. Any questions? Question. Was Vancouver Island always assumed to be in British control? Vancouver Island? Yeah. Uh, I, I wouldn't say anything was assumed necessarily. The, if the 49th parallel had that historical precedent, and so the United States expected nothing north of the 49th parallel, but Vancouver Island, of course, is this sort of anomaly where the 49th parallel runs right through it. So there were no assumptions necessarily uh, with regard to Vancouver Island, um, but the British certainly coveted that, uh, as well as like the Strait of Georgia, the, the waterways uh, around the southern tip of, of Vancouver Island. Yeah. Other questions? Everybody cool? All right, remember, folks, I always say, I understand every word that's coming out of my mouth. If any of this is not clear, please stop me and ask for clarification. All right. So, disputed area, 
Britain and the United States both hoping to acquire the area surrounding Puget Sound. The British initially... Oh, question, Fred. I do have a question. Um, on the top of this map, it says extreme U.S. claim. Does that mean that we claimed that part north to be part of Alaska? Uh, in certain respects. We're actually going to get to the U.S. claims going all the way to 50 or 40 a little bit later on today. But yes, the, the, the United States certainly... Um, especially given sort of the mood of national expansionism in the 1840s, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, the United States certainly had designs um, on the entire Pacific coast. Yeah. The, the, um, William Henry Seward, Secretary of State to Presidents Lincoln and Johnson, the man who negotiated the Treaty of Session with Russia that purchased Alaska in 1867, William Henry Seward, even before he was Secretary of State, when he was a senator from New York in the 1840s, he was an ardent expansionist who made no secret of the fact that he hoped to acquire not just Alaska, but also British Columbia. Um, and so, yes, certainly how serious the American claims were that far north um, is, a, is a matter for debate but it certainly was in the, the, the uh, public discourse, and it certainly was of interest to Americans. Yeah. But I'll, I'll say more about that uh, later on in lecture today. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. So oh, when it comes to the, this dispute then, in the disputed area, Great Britain initially had a much stronger hand than did the United States. Remember, George Vancouver had been the first European to explore Puget Sound, not just explore it, he named it, right? He named it for, for one of his, uh, one of his uh, countrymen, Peter Puget. The Hudson's Bay Company, in the course of organizing the region as a colony and an, and an economy of extractive resources, had established Fort Vancouver, on the Columbia River, a number of other forts and trading posts, not just on the Columbia, but also on the Fraser and the Snake and other rivers of the Oregon country. And the Hudson's Bay Company had also uh, cultivated and developed mostly cordial relationships with the indigenous peoples of the region. Remember, the Hudson's Bay Company could not function without native labor. Many of the furs, both in the maritime fur trade of the 1700s and then the land-based fur trade of the early 1800s, much of those furs were being harvested not by the European colonizers, but by native peoples who then traded with the Europeans for those furs. And so it was in the interest of the Hudson's Bay Company to develop relationships with native peoples, which the company had done to great uh, economic, not to mention social and political success in the era. So Britain has very well-established claims, um, uh, uh, not just of occupancy, but also use of the Oregon country. Many of George Simpson's designs for the Hudson's Bay Company, from the time he uh, assumed the directorship in 1821, well into the 1840s, were based on the assumption that the British would hold on to western Washington and lose eastern Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, the land south and east of the Columbia. And remember, of course, the Washington Territory does not exist at this time. Idaho does not exist at this time. But I'm using the words Western Washington, Idaho, and so forth simply to, to orient you to the regions that I'm talking about. And so George Simpson, in organizing the Hudson's Bay Company, had operated under the belief that they would eventually lose south and east of the Columbia, but that they would hold on to Western Washington. And so, for example, Simpson encouraged American missionaries to enter Oregon and establish their missions south and east of the Columbia. He accepted settlement by 
American settlers in the Willamette River Valley. And remember, he also tried to extinguish the supply of furs south and east of the Columbia. This is the so-called scorched earth policy that I mentioned in a previous lecture, whereby Simpson instructed Hudson's Bay Company personnel to trap beaver and marten and other fur-bearing mammals south and east of the Columbia almost to extinction, thereby hoping to um, remove any incentive that American fur trappers might have for entering the region. Well into the early 1840s, Simpson believed that the British had to hold on to Western Washington for the long-term uh, sustainability of the company. His thinking would change relatively quickly, however. In 1842, Simpson decides to relocate the headquarters of the Hudson's Bay Company from Fort Vancouver on the Columbia River up to Victoria on Vancouver Island. This signals a change in his thinking. With more and more Americans beginning to enter the Oregon country, he begins to recognize that the loss of Western Washington is in fact a distinct possibility. It's clear by that time, 1842, that the balance of power is shifting in the Oregon Territory. Now, when the United States agreed to that joint occupation in 1818, it was initially um, grateful for the opportunity. <clears throat> the U.S simply did not have resources at that time to make a great imprint on the Pacific Northwest. And so even to be granted joint ownership, or joint occupancy, excuse me, with Britain was seen by uh, Americans as a win. The United States did not have a navy at that time that was as powerful as Britain's. The United States did not have any sort of colonizing agent that had the resources, the capital, the expertise to colonize the region the way Britain did. The Hudson's Bay Company had been a monopoly for centuries prior to its entrance to the Pacific Northwest. The United States did not have any sort of colonizing agent on par with a company like that. The great majority of American population lived far to the east, east of the Mississippi River. And American fur trappers, for as much attention and interest as there was in the region, it wasn't until the end of the 1820s that American fur trappers had successfully um, traversed the Rocky Mountains and began to enter the Oregon country at all. And so these factors then, put together, would seem to indicate that Britain had a much stronger claim than did the United States to the Oregon country. In fact, the United States really held a very weak hand throughout the 1820s and 1830s. This begins to change, however, in large part because ideas about American expansionism really had taken hold by the 1840s. The United States had annexed Texas in the 1840s, went to war with Mexico for the remainder of Mexico's northern holdings. Upon the defeat of Mexico in 1848, the United States takes possession of the lands that would become the American Southwest, states of, of New Mexico, uh, Arizona, Southern California, and so on. And moreover, national politicians uh, in the United States took up Western expansionism as a key campaign issue. The Monroe Doctrine, 1823, uh, something you may have encountered in other history courses. The Monroe Doctrine, uh, a, a position that opposed any European colonization or involvement by European nations in the Western Hemisphere. 
And by the 1840s, the idea of manifest destiny has really taken hold among Americans. Manifest destiny, the idea that Americans had a God-given right to settle the continent, to expand all the way to the Pacific coast and settle the continent. Not just a right, but a divine right, a God-given right. Here we see a a, a famous uh, painting by John Gast, American Progress. I'm guessing you have probably encountered this painting before in other history courses or or, or other classes. Um, And here, of course, it's a a not very subtle depiction, is it, of of manifest destiny. Um, Not many hidden metaphors here, right? We see Columbia, a female uh, personification of the United States, leading settlers west bringing light into darkness, right? We see, uh, well, let me ask you, what do you see in this this painting? What are are some sort of metaphors and things that you see um, uh, sort of as evidence of of American uh, expansionism and and manifest destiny? Uh, Here, Fred, and then we'll go uh, to the back, the next. Um, The Indians are fleeing toward the West. Right. Yeah, if you look to the far um, left of of the image, you see indigenous peoples essentially being pushed out of frame, if not pushed, uh, you know, off the continent altogether. Uh, Max, in the back. Um, I was going to say that you see uh, roads being created where wagons are driving, and you see railroads being created with the trains heading west where there's none. So it's like infrastructure is being built where Americans go. Look at all the transportation infrastructure, right? We've got wagon trains. We've got uh, steam locomotives. If you look sort of in the far right frame, there are ships and bridges uh, being constructed uh, across, the, across the rivers. Yeah, Jose. I just also wanted to add that I think you can kind of see a city all over the top far right of the picture. Yeah. Like representing civilization. And kind of that's a part of the So like that's... What you guys is it's bringing to the West civilization and right, and it gets darker the farther left you go to the picture. So it's like the light crossing into the exactly. West. Exactly. Cities already being constructed here, right? The the, the rush of, of quote unquote civilization, as evidenced as you point out by the the light of uh, Colombia uh, being brought into the darkness of, of the of the wilderness of the continent. Right. Yeah. Uh, what else? What, did, what is she holding in her right hand and in her left hand? Can you tell? It's like wire that's set up from like a telegraph telegram or something. Mm-hmm. It also looks like perhaps a Bible, which uh, is an important key aspect to ideology behind Manifest Destiny. It was really interwoven with Christian beliefs that American Christians were you know, inherently, like, they were divinely appointed to populate and settle this land. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. In her left hand, a, a telegraph line establishing communications. In, in her right hand, it's a little difficult here to tell what the book is, but I think a Bible is a pretty good guess. I mean, manifest destiny is the idea that Americans have a God-given right to expand across the continent. So, yeah, I think, that's, I think that's exactly right. Again, not very subtle, right? Metaphors aren't exactly uh, hidden here. Um, but this is a pretty good representation of the way many Americans were beginning to think about the Western territories in the 1840s. And remember, as I've said in, in previous lectures, this is Thomas Jefferson's dream, right? Right? I mean, Thomas Jefferson, even before he was president, even before the Louisiana Purchase, he recognized the lands, what he considered open lands of the West. Of course, they weren't open. People had been living on those lands for 10,000 years. But in the American imagination, the continent was open, free land available for the taking. Jefferson believed that expansionism across the continent was vital to the survival of this experiment known as American democracy and small-r republicanism, right? Well, by the 1840s, 
Thomas Jefferson is deceased, but these ideas are certainly living on, particularly as more and more Americans are seeking opportunity, private land ownership, private enterprise in what were considered the open lands of the West. All right, so American interest in the Pacific Northwest having stagnated for decades suddenly increases dramatically. It takes the form of both settlers emigrating to the West, but then also politicians and American statesmen increasingly becoming willing to confront the British in order to resolve this boundary dispute in America's favor. And again, the respective approaches to colonization on the part of Britain and the United States are a study in contrast. Remember, the Hudson's Bay Company discouraged settlement. It made no attempt to bring European women to the region to start families and to uh, establish a permanent settler society. No attempt at all. The HBC discouraged private ownership of lands. It was purely an extractive resource colony. And indigenous peoples were viewed by the Hudson's Bay Company for their utility in company operations. There was no drive on the part of the British to dispossess native peoples of lands, no effort to place them onto reservations. That would have been detrimental to the company's operations, not to mention its profits. Americans, by contrast, are, are, are essentially the opposite in every uh, aspect. Americans expected to bring to the Oregon country the more individualistic and democratic attitudes of their society. Americans insisted on private ownership of land. Americans insisted on having a voice in their government, on permanent settlements. And indeed, many of the American rival, or many of the American arrivals in the West, in this era, are families. And then finally, for the American project, the displacement and dispossession of native peoples was essential. If America is going to establish a permanent settler society on the lands of the West and of the Oregon country, the indigenous population has to be removed in some way from those lands. That, of course, is going to take the form of the removal of native peoples to reservations, which, as I mentioned, we'll talk about uh, in lecture next week. One uh, official of the Hudson's Bay Company, um, he summarized the differences in the, uh, the, the, the two nations' respective approaches to colonization. And this is what a, a Hudson's Bay Company official had to say uh, about farms in the Willamette Valley. Those farms, quote, could flourish only through the protection of equal laws, the influence of free trade, the accession of respectable inhabitants, while the fur trade much suffers by each innovation. Close quote. Okay, let's go through that again and sort of unpack what this HB official is saying. Farms in the Willamette Valley being established by Americans at this time, quote, could flourish only through the protection of equal laws. That's the antithesis of monopoly, right? That's the, that's the antithesis of the manner with which the Hudson's Bay Company had been operating for centuries. The farms of the Willamette Valley could flourish only through the influence of free trade, again, the antithesis of monopoly, the accession of respectable inhabitants, and he's referring there to the families of settlers, um, as opposed to unattached male fur traders working for the HBC, HBC, 
while the fur trade much suffers by each innovation, close quote. The respective approaches of these two nations to this area could not be more different. And so Americans then, starting in the 1840s, began taking formal steps to assert control over the region. The Americans borrow from the um, uh, Iowa Territory's Code of Laws and Oregon settlers, essentially replicating the laws of the territory of Iowa, uh, form a, a provisional government or governments in Oregon between 1843 uh, and 1845. The first laws enacted uh, by those provisional, that, that provisional government provided for the acquisition and secure ownership of land, the holding of elections, and also the formation of a militia. Later legislation then provides for an executive branch, a judicial branch, and then divided the territory into counties for local administration. Importantly, the provisional government also outlawed the migration and residence of African Americans, both uh, free and enslaved, to Oregon. This is something we're going to talk about uh, in a future lecture in this class. And so just like step back here and think about this for a minute. The American interest in the region went from almost nothing in 1838 to significant and substantial just five, six, seven years later. As I mentioned, the population itself increased. Only 150 Americans living in the Oregon country in 1840. Five years later, 5,000. These are very rapid developments with regard to America's interest in the region. U.S. Um, officials, politicians, become increasingly aggressive in their attitudes. Uh, James Polk, running for president in 1844, uh, embraces a, a slogan, 5440 or fight, which means that if the, if the British did not yield the entire Oregon country all the way up to 54 degrees, 40 minutes of latitude, that very northern border of the Oregon country, Fred, that you were asking about a moment ago, if the, if the British were not willing to concede the entirety of the Oregon country all the way to 5440, well, by God, Americans were prepared to go to war over it. Now, there's some debate among historians as to whether this was actually a campaign slogan uh, by Polk or if it only became you know, so part of his rhetoric after he had become president. For our purposes, however, this slogan uh, indicates the belligerent attitude that Americans were increasingly beginning to hold. Again, if we step back from this, it's remarkable how quickly American attitudes are changing. Almost complete disinterest in Oregon in the 1820s and 1830s, save for a few mountain men and some Presbyterian missionaries. By 1844, you have the President of the United States threatening war against Britain over the Oregon country. Now, it doesn't actually come to war, thankfully. And in 1846, Britain and the United States agree uh, to a formal resolution of this boundary issue, the Oregon Treaty of 1846. And what the treaty does, as you can see here, it extends the border between um, the United States and the nation that would become Canada, extends it um, all the way along the 49th parallel exactly as the Americans had wanted. The U.S. secured 
Puget Sound. The British then lost western Washington, but retained the interior coastline of the Strait of Georgia and Vancouver Island. The HBC also retained the right of navigation on the Columbia River, and it retained its substantial holdings along the Columbia, basically all of the forts and supply depots that it had established over the decades in what was now American territory. The transfer of the region of the the, the lower Columbia to the United States, however, did not bode well for continued operations by the Hudson's Bay Company, uh, and the company would eventually sell its interests and its assets uh, in the American Northwest and retrench um, back to uh, British Columbia. Uh, okay, let me pause here. Any questions? Any discussion? Actually, let me ask you a question, and I'm genuinely curious about this. It's my feeling that there are very few Americans aware of the fact that this area, the area in which we are living and studying today, was once essentially British territory. Have you heard this story before? Were you aware of these developments? Yes? Well, that, I am impressed. It's, it, it's my experience that, that not many people are. Uh, any questions uh, about anything so far? Yes? Uh, I don't know if you're going to get to it, but um, how did uh, the British government take control of Vancouver Island completely, but give up spots like Point Roberts and the San Juan Islands and have that abrupt stop of the 49th parallel. Yeah. How did that come to be? Yeah, the, 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 the dispute over the San Juan Islands is an entirely different... Well, it's not an entirely different story. It's part of this story. We're, we're not going to cover it today. We can, we can come back to that again. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's interesting. It's like any treaty, this is um, essentially a function of compromise, right? Um, and so... Um, actually, I, I, I'm not quite done yet. I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how this, uh, this agreement, this treaty, is remembered on both sides of the border. Um, uh, but yeah, it is, it is fascinating as to um, exactly how the, the British, whose hand was once so strong, ended up relenting and ceding the territory to the United States, but maintaining Vancouver Island and the, and the waterways. It really comes down to maritime transport, right? As long as both nations had access to the Pacific Ocean, which the treaty facilitated for both, um, that was seen as beneficial for both nations. Other questions? Okay. Oh, in the back. I, I have to tell you, I'm really impressed that so many of you have heard of this story before. I think I need to give you all like a bonus point on your midterm exam or something just for, just for that. Yeah, question. Yeah, uh, so I was curious. Why was the UK so like willing uh, to relent? Did they not have like the same like cultural interest in the region? So they were just like, we'll give it up like the Americans or? Yeah, it, it's, it's a bit confusing. Um, one, what we see happening here in the era is that the, the, the migration of so many Americans into the region was, was really represented handwriting on the wall for Britain. And, and Britain came to recognize that any attempt to hold on to Western Washington in the face of so much American migration was, was only going to sort of exacerbate hostilities between the two nations. There's also, remember, there's gold being discovered in the area, right? There's potential for gold in, on the Fraser River. Um, uh, and, and, and in fact, there was a time um, in the 1860s, after the period we're talking about here, where gold strikes in British Columbia actually meant that there were more Americans in British Columbia than British subjects, right? That comes after the events that we're talking about here, but, but really what it sort of comes down to is that 
George Simpson and, and, and the British, um, the directors of the Hudson's Bay Company, they saw what was coming, and they knew that like the 5,000 Americans in the country in 1845, that number was only going to continually grow. And so it, it's, it's really evidence of, of compromise. Um, one of the other things I'll, I'll address here in just a moment is that the nation of Canada does not exist at this time. And so the, the British interests in the region were established back in London. Now, opinion and attitudes about the British subjects who actually lived in the region would have been to maintain its presence in Western Washington. Back in London, however, sort of viewing its, you know, its holdings, not just in North America, but British holdings around the world, this is sort of one small part of that much larger picture um, to which the, 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 the British um, negotiators over this treaty would have had that much more global view. So I guess the answer, Max, like so many things in history, is this really, really complicated, right? Like, I've said this to you before. History is that unique discipline where our goal as historians is to make things more complicated, not less, right? Um, anyway, I hope that answers your question. Um, all right, let's, let's continue then. Uh, and let's wrap up here um, by thinking about this. How is this treaty remembered by Americans and by Canadians today? If, in fact, it's remembered at all. Canadians and Americans tend to view the Oregon Treaty very, very differently. As with most um, historical subjects, how you view history, how you perceive the meaning of the past depends very, very much on the position from which you are viewing it in the present, right? Um, John Findlay, Professor Emeritus of History here at the University of Washington. This is what Dr. Finley has written uh, about the treaty and how it sort of exists in the public mind today. So this is Dr. Finley commenting on the legacy of the, the Treaty of 1846. Quote, Few Americans today pay much attention to the Oregon Treaty of 1846. The nation's acquisitions by war have seemed more dramatic, and even its acquisitions by purchase have seemed somehow more memorable. The diplomatic negotiations that produced the treaty perhaps appear dull, as if the two sides finally just arrived at a fair compromise. Maybe there is a sense, too, that the United States did not take the far corner of the Pacific Northwest so much from another nation or people as it did from a company, the HBC, whose own operations were inhibiting American-style development of the region. It would be best, however, to keep in mind that in Canada, across the border that the Oregon Treaty extended in 1846, feelings are different. There, the Oregon Treaty is often remembered vividly as a loss and one of many examples of American disrespect for Canadian borders and national integrity. And indeed, Dr. Finley may very well be correct. A Canadian geographer, James R. Gibson, writing in 1985, this is what, um, this is what Gibson, a Canadian geographer, had to say on this question. Quote, the Oregon Treaty was not a fair compromise. There was no division of the Oregon Triangle. That's a reference um, to those disputed lands in western Washington. There was no division of the Oregon Triangle, all of which went to the United States. Canadians have valid reasons for regretting and even resenting the Oregon settlement, 
since the British claim to the territory north of the Columbia Snake Clearwater River system was at least as good as, if not better than, that of the United States on the grounds of discovery, exploration, and settlement. And since the future Canadian Dominion was deprived of any harbor on Puget Sound, Canadians should not forget that they were dispossessed of a part of their rightful Columbia heritage, a heritage whose economic potential in general and agricultural possibilities in particular were initially and successfully demonstrated by the Hudson's Bay Company. They should also remember that whenever it is tritely declared that Canada and the United States share the longest undefended border in the world, it is so mainly because the stronger American Republic won its northern boundary disputes at the expense of its weaker neighbor, just as its southern boundary was gained at the expense of a weaker Mexico. Close quote. Oh, right? I say to you guys all the time, history is not the past. History is not something that happened 200 years ago and has no bearing on our present lives. We live with history every single day. I mean, did you have any idea that these sorts of feelings, these sorts of resentments would exist, you know, going on two centuries after the the treaty itself? We live with history every single day. Every single day. All right. Questions, comments, thoughts? What was the year on that quotation for the Canadian? The Canadian? Yeah. That was 1985. 1985. Okay. Yeah. What was the like, general British population in the region once the treaty was signed? Oh, well, the... the, the at the time, I mean, the, the population, it, it would have been entirely the Hudson's Bay Company, right? I mean, it would have been, person, it would have been company personnel. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, like with the Oregon country, the, the population of British subjects in British Columbia would have grown significantly over this era. Um, and in fact... By 1867, when the United States purchases Alaska from Russia, as I mentioned before, William Henry Seward was very clear about his ambitions of acquiring British Columbia also, and British Columbia becomes a Canadian province in 1869, in large part an effort to sort of, you know, forestall any American interests in the region. Um, so, So... so emigration to British Columbia would have been increasing uh, at the same time. In terms of numbers, I, I'm afraid I don't know. I can't give you population figures. But, but yeah, there, there certainly would have been more and more emigrants to the region, both British and American, as I mentioned, particularly once gold is discovered in this region. Yeah, yeah Fred. Uh, but is it right to say that... Um the American interest in Western Washington was for settlement, whereas the British was just for fur. Yes, very much so. So I think, you know, that gives the Americans probably a better claim. I'm well, I mean, it certainly worked out that way, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that's an excellent point. If it, it, this history may have played... Let me preface this by saying historians are, are loath to engage in what-ifs. That said this history certainly would have played out very differently had the HBC encouraged permanent settlement. That is, if European women had been brought to the region, married the personnel of the HBC, they start families, they establish permanent communities in western Washington. Again, with the caveat that historians are loath to engage in what-ifs, that is certainly... the, 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 The absence of British permanent settlement... And the interest of Americans in permanent settlement certainly plays out in very different ways here. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? All right, well, thanks, everybody. Let's, uh, let's take a quick break, and then we'll come back and uh, keep talking history, all right? All right, thanks, everyone. <laughs>
Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. If you're interested in hearing more history, check out Season 2 of the Presidential Recordings podcast. The second season focuses on taped conversations between President Richard Nixon on topics ranging from the Watergate scandal to his nominees for the Supreme Court. The Presidential Recordings podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts. 